Okay, yeah, so thanks for that. Uh, looking at whether bacteria are dead or just VBNC. So we, we ended up on Tuesday with uh, uh, the activity of water. Uh, this, this thing that the physical chemists uh, invented to, to cause us endless pain. Okay, so it, it, it might be a, a, a pain, but it's a very important concept, especially in food microbiology, because the amount of water which is chemically available in a foodstuff, the activity of water, is a limiting factor for the growth of most microbes. So, for example, uh, all kind of fresh food has got a very high activity of water. There's enough water available in it for all sorts of bacteria to grow. Uh, 0 0.98, that's about the equivalent of seawater, 0.6 molar salt, okay? So uh, most gram negatives and gram positives can grow at this kind of activity of water. Something that's a little bit drier, like a loaf of bread, it's been in the oven and baked and lost some of its water. This will have an activity of about 0.95. Most gram negatives won't grow on this, but most gram positives still will be able to. And something that's been preserved, you know, a ham or some other preserved meat product, not really dry, 0.9. Most gram positive cocky can still grow on your ham sandwich. Uh, some kind of sausage that's a little bit drier, like salami, most gram-positive cocky will stop growing, but Staphylococcus can still grow, okay? So these are halo-tolerant bacteria. They can grow in relatively low conditions of water activity. But down below that, basically no more bacteria can grow on foodstuffs. And you have to have these, you know, really specialists, like uh, these uh, extremophile salt-loving bacteria, so for things that are really dry, like a saucisson sec or cereals, by which I mean, I don't mean like cornflakes and stuff, I mean grains of wheat, barley, they're quite dried out and concentrated protein and carbohydrate. No bacteria can grow on this because the activity of water is too low. And then down below 0 0.6, you've got really dehydrated foods. I don't know, dried milk, uh, pasta, this kind of stuff. So they, 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 they're not going to be contaminated by bacteria because there's not enough uh, water that is available inside the food. Now I just mentioned fungi up here. Yes? Yes, yes. So basically, how to read the table, you have to read it like all these bacteria can grow from 101 down to this is the minimum that they where they can still grow. OK, so all Staphylococcus can grow here. Uh, Gram positives can all go down to 0 0.95. So you have to kind of imagine down to this level. OK, okay so yeah. Just one mention for fungi here is that after about 0 0.85, you don't really have any bacteria that are growing anymore on foodstuffs. Uh, but you can have fungus you know, uh, that, that grow. So penicillium and aspergillus can cause spoiling of foods which have an activity of water less than 0 0.85. So that's why you, know, uh, you can get uh, crops which have been harvested and you can get fungus growing on them. Now, so that's the, oh, what do I want to say here? Okay, so uh, oh, what you can do in food technology is to try and exploit these different factors to prevent food spoiling, okay? Uh, activity of water, oxygen availability, temperature this kind of stuff. So for example, if you've got some like industrially baked bread, 
it's going to be relatively dry, drier probably than the baker, the bread you'll get from the bakers on the corner. So your activity of water will probably be, oh, I wonder, let's have a look. Okay, about 0.95. So most bacteria won't grow on it that well. Uh, most gram negatives anyway. And, uh, but it can easily be colonized by, you know, uh, mold, penicillium aspergillus. Uh, unfortunately for us, these molds are obligate aerobes, so they must have molecular oxygen to grow. So inside your packaging here, the atmosphere is replaced by a mix of nitrogen and CO2. So it's a mixture of oxygen availability and activity of water, which keeps the, the, the product uh, non-contaminated. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, if you ever buy something like this from the supermarket and there's some mold growing. The reason is because, you know, the packaging will have been damaged and there will be some spores in there and because the oxygen gets in, then they can grow. Okay. Uh, next one is, okay, anybody know what this is? Yeah, what's that? Yeah, it's dog food or cat food or something. So this is a kind of a quite low activity of water. Almost, you know, nothing can, no, no microbes can grow on this. It's too dry, but it's still, it's not, it's not, you can still eat it directly. Okay. You don't have to like cook it like pasta. So this can, you know, can remain stable at room temperature for months. So you don't need any special uh, storage. And then you've got stuff like cheese. So the activity of water goes down a little bit. And uh, so, you know, most bacteria are not going to grow. And the pH is low on the inside. So you've got a combination of acidity and activity of water, which means, you know, this stuff can stay down in the cellar for months as long as you don't, like, cut a slice out, out of it. And then you have, like, yogurts and stuff. So you've got low pH. Activity of water is very high, of course, because it's very liquid and you need low temperature. So you have these two things that are combining to prevent bacteria from growing. So temperature, pH, activity of water, and oxygen. Okay, the last thing we need to think about that uh, bacteria that are, is going to uh, impact on bacterial growth is radiation. Okay, so visible light is not a big deal for any bacteria any more than it is for, is for us. But uh, different types of radiation <coughs> can be toxic. So ionizing radiation, UV, A, B, and C can all have effects on biological molecules. And those that are really going to be uh, dangerous are you know, ionizing radiation. Uh, which don't really work by directly hitting DNA molecules. So they're toxic because as ionizing radiation passes through a cell, it's going to interact with water molecules and produce reactive oxygen species. And those oxygen, you know, activated oxygen molecules are going to, are going to chemically damage DNA and other molecules in the cell. Uh, what else do I have to say about this is that, uh, okay, so it's, it's very useful because you can use gamma radiation to sterilize a lot of products. So for sterile plastic wear that we use in the lab, you can't put it in the autoclave, right? All the plastic will, will melt. Uh, so all the packets are sterilized by gamma radiation. It's also true for stuff in hospitals. You know, plastic ware that needs to be plugged into somebody's body at some point will be sterilized by gamma radiation. Okay, for UV radiation, you have UV, A, B, and C. And the only way I can kind of remember which way round the wavelength goes with the letters is that I kind of remember it's, it's going further away from the visible spectrum. Okay, so visible light is like 400 to 700 nanometers and so you know UVA is the closest to visible then B then UVC so UVC is the shortest wavelength of UV light 
UVB, this is what you, everybody can get uh, if you're out in the sun for too long. And it's directly absorbed by DNA. So it's got direct effect on DNA and also can activate reactive ox oxygen species. And UVC, which in fact we don't have to worry about on the, uh, the surface of the planet because it's blocked by the ozone layer. This is directly absorbed by DNA and you know, really damages DNA. Can be used to sterilize water. So there's some use for this. Okay, so uh, this doesn't really exist. Well, okay, so if you live in Brittany, you get some kind of radioactive dose all through your whole life because of, uh, you know, the radon in the, in the granite and stuff like that. So, you know, yeah, it's true. <laughs> uh, but it, it's not like a massively high dose or anything. Uh, you know, anything that, that grows out in the open in the light can have a bit of UVB. So bacteria have, you know, <laughs> mechanisms to repair damaged DNA. And I guess the big champion of this is a Deinococcus radiodurans, which is you know, this bacterial species that can withstand a massive amount of uh, uh, ionizing radiation. Uh, there's something I, I read this. You know, let me see if I've got it here. I think it's like something like can survive something like. 5,000 grays of radiation and something like 50 grays is enough to kill a human being, something like that. Uh, this is a bit weird because it doesn't actually grow in conditions where there's a lot of radiation. So you just wonder why has this thing evolved to be so resistant? And it seems like there's a kind of crossover between the mechanisms that bacteria use to resist uh, desiccation or oxygen damage, you know, chemical damage through reactive oxygen species. And if they can resist these types of conditions, they can also resist a radiation. Okay. All right. So last thing we need to know about this, you know, we need to know the definitions of each of these terms, psychrophile, mesophile, thermophile, uh, Ah, oh, yeah, I didn't mention this, did I, right? When I was talking about this, I think I forgot to say that. So why is it interesting to look at these bacteria that can still grow in extreme conditions? Well, one of them is because in thermophilic bacteria, all their proteins function at 50 degrees or 80 degrees or even 95 degrees. So thermotolerant DNA polymerase, TAC from Thermus aquaticus, TAC polymerase, it's essential for the polymerase chain reaction, PCR. And we can use it because this enzyme will stay active after multiple cycles of heating up to 95 degrees and it still works. It doesn't get denatured. So, you know, a lot of things we can do in genetic engineering, you know, micro molecular biology and biotechnology come from getting enzymes from thermophiles. At the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, enzymes that you want to work at low temperatures, maybe outside or, or in water, treating water or something like this, you can get them from uh, psychrophilic bacteria that can have some industrial uses because you can like spray them outside and even if it's like four degrees, they will still work. You don't have to heat the whole place up to 37 degrees for the enzymes to work, like for hours, okay? Okay, so I forgot about that. Uh, what else about this? Yeah, you have to know uh, the difference between the definitions of aerobic, microaerophilic and then facultative aerotolerant and strict anaerobes and who's got superoxide dismutase who's got catalase and then these definitions addition acidophile neutral alkalophile the importance in food microbiology okay that is you know uh, lactobacillus uh, streptococcus uh, thermophilus used for making yogurt this kind of stuff helotolerant helophile uh, activity of water Okay, so that's it for the last previous lecture. So I'll be able to come on to
yeah, better hurry up on this. So we got, and that's, so all of this afternoon, we are going to be thinking about uh, bacterial energy metabolism. And this relates to the point in the introduction that you can find bacteria everywhere, living on practically anything, performing kind of wide variety of strange biochemical transformations. Now, the way this is going to work is, first I'm going to talk a little bit about nutrient uptake, you know, how they get different uh, chemicals. Uh, and then I'm going to go on to the, the real part of the, the lectures, which is about the different types of energy metabolism in bacteria. Now, what is going to be a bit complicated is how bacteria perform and get energy from sources that are very unusual, like chemolithotrophs, and how bacteria can uh, live without oxygen. So all the different types of anaerobic uh, metabolism. And there's kind of two ways to try and learn this stuff. You can just like take the pragmatic approach, oh, this. This, this stuff, I just got to learn it. So you just go to a book and you revise and you try and learn it by heart, okay? This is one way. Uh, the other way to try and do this is to understand really what is going on. And uh, that, that's not so easy because it relies on a lot of concepts in chemistry that I think are not that simple to understand. But never mind. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's worth trying to do this because then you'll actually be, be able to understand oh, okay why it works the way it does okay so for that reason i'm going to start off with some like basic concepts in energy metabolism first to make sure everybody is clear about these things and then try and go on to the different types of bacterial energy metabolism that exist okay so first right the, this is going to be like the easy part is how bacteria take up nutrients so for some small molecules like gases, um, maybe, I don't know, methane, methanol, ethanol, stuff like that, uh, they can just diffuse across bacterial membranes and bacteria don't have to do anything in particular to, uh, to, to recover these molecules. However, for most interesting molecules, the uh, bacterial membranes are going to be uh, present a barrier, okay? Um, so there are two types of pore proteins in bacterial membranes. There are some that just function, they just like have a hole in the membrane and molecules can pass through. And this is just going to help them get across the membrane, but only if the, con the exterior concentration is higher than the concentration on the interior of the membrane. So this is called facilitated diffusion and these types of pore proteins cannot import molecules if they are very, very rare outside the bacterium. So two types, permeases, which are substrate specific, they'll, be, they'll allow certain sugars through the outer membrane of the gram negatives, or porins, which are just basically a hole, and anything smaller than it, per se, six or 700 Daltons, will be able to diffuse through the pore. Okay, so what is the point of this? The, the, these you generally find in the outer membrane of gram negative bacteria. And that just means that you've got the plasma membrane here, outer membrane here and outside the cell here. So this is just means that in the periplasm, the concentration of sugar, amino acids, small molecules is going to be the same as what you have outside. But in fact, what you want is the concentration to be lower than what you have outside. And that's the role of these active transport proteins which are going to be in the plasma membrane. So as soon as you have a tiny concentration in the periplasm, 
then the active transport is going to import whatever it is. So in fact, the concentration in the periplasm of all this stuff, sugar, amino acids, whatever it is, is always going to be very low. And that's why the porins and the permeases in the outer membrane are just going to let things through. Okay. Okay, so I'm not really going to talk any more about this. Active transport, we're going to look at the different systems that exist and how they work and which types of molecules are taken up by which type of system. So the ABC transporters, ABC is for ATP binding cassette. And there are two components to these systems. So the membrane component is the pore. And in the periplasm, there's a solute binding protein, which will specifically bind onto whatever is going to be imported. And then this complex of the binding protein and the ligand bind to the transporter and then ATP hydrolysis is required to transport the solute into the cytosol of the bacterium. So this is used for some sugars. Uh, amino acids generally, okay? If you get this in an exam question, amino acids, glutamate, histidine, leucine, and phosphate. Okay, so it's active transport against the concentration gradient. You need to use energy to pull in these molecules. Now the other system, well, second one is symport antiport. So all bacteria will maintain a proton gradient with a higher proton concentration in the periplasm, lower inside the cell. So this is a proton motive force that can be used to import different types of molecules, either as for you know, lactose, amino acids, but mostly these kind of four carbon carbohydrates, which are acidic. So malic acid, oxaloacetic acid. So they are co-transported with protons. And some bacteria use sodium symport as well. Yeah, so I would, I would say, you know, malate oxaloacetate for this. Lactose kind of an exception because, well, it's interesting, but... <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I always try and tend to remember these by different categories of stuff by different transporters. So if it's a question in a test, you don't get mixed up, all right? So that's why I think, you know, amino acids, phosphate for the ABC transporters, oxaloacetate, malate for the symport antiport system. And then the last one is group transport. And that's useful for monosaccharide sugars, often used for the import of glucose. Now this is very a little bit complicated, but it's very clever. So what is going to happen is that the energy required to import the glucose comes from a phosphate, the, 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 well, the cleavage of a phosphate bond attached to this protein 2B in the transport system. And when this phosphate bond is broken, the energy that it releases is used to do two things at the same time. Firstly, to transport the glucose molecule across the membrane, and secondly, to phosphorylate it. Now that's very interesting because glucose 6-phosphate is the first step in glycoly glycolysis, which we'll see a bit later on. So if this glucose is being imported to be used as a source of, of metabolic energy, 
then this is like you get like uh, the first step would be import and then phosphorylate. So if this was to be done with an ABC transporter, you would need to spend one molecule of ATP to import the glucose and then one molecule of ATP just to phosphorylate it. Whereas this is, you know, it's, it's, you save one ATP because it does both things at the same time. So that, that, that's, why, that's why it's so clever. So where does this phosphate come from on the 2B subunit? Well, originally it comes from phosphoenolpyruvate, which is uh, an intermediate in glycolysis. So it's going to be uh, uh, transformed into pyruvate. So the phosphate group comes off. First, it gets transferred onto this E1 complex and then transferred onto the heat uh, sensitive protein. And then, so then onto the different group two subunits of the system here. Uh, don't know if you really know, need to know this in, in detail, but uh, so the E1 and the heat sensitive protein are common for different types of sugars, whereas the group two proteins, they are specific for a particular sugar. Anyway, so what substance is imported this way? Basically, glucose into E. coli, group transport. Okay, so this is found, okay, PTS of uh, sugar phosphotransferase system, found in many facultative anaerobes and some obligate anaerobes. It's almost always absent in obligate aerobes. Okay, so why? Why doesn't everybody use this system if it's so great? Just think about it for a minute. an escape attempt. Yeah, think about it, but, but quickly. Uh, try and see if I can get 20 votes and then we'll move on. Okay. Okay, 19 votes, that will have to do, right? Oh, 20, thank you. Right, so uh, when I was writing this question, I thought like two of these answers, you should be able to exclude them for being wrong. Uh, answer four, aerobes are gram plus and phosphotransfer systems only exist in gram negative bacteria. Well, well, that's wrong because we've got, look, common in facultative anaerobes like staphylococcus, gram plus, right? 
So this answer is, is wrong and the, uh, because of what's written here. <laughs> okay, answer three. Th this is also wrong because glycolysis, the first steps are going to be the same in aerobes and anaerobes. The first step is always going to be glucose phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate. So, so you might not know this, but in fact, this is, this is wrong. So that leaves the other two uh, answers and uh, one and two. One, this, this biochemically you might think, yeah, that might actually be true. And you could test that. You could take E. coli, culture the, you know, put them, get them to grow in the presence of uh, uh, oxygen and without oxygen. You can test whether they still use the phosphotransfer system. And they do use the phosphotransfer system. It still works when oxygen is present, okay? So it's not a uh, one. So that leaves this one. And this is the real idea. So spending one ATP to use an ABC transport system is not a big deal for, for aerobes because they will be uh, using respiration to get something like 38 ATP molecules per glucose. So if you spend one on the import, well, hey, come on, we're rich. No, it's no big deal. But for anaerobes, as we'll see, that are using fermentation to generate metabolic energy, you, they're going to get something like two molecules of ATP per glucose. So if you have to spend one just to get the damn thing inside, and then... That, you know, that's a lot. You're losing like half of your uh, ATP yield. So it's a big deal for anaerobes. And it makes more sense for them, even if the system is complicated, you have to produce all these different proteins. In energy terms, it's more important for anaerobes to, to do this because they save one ATP. Okay, so yeah, what else? So that's... ABC transporters, symport antiport, uh, group transport, PTS. And the last one is iron transport. So um, iron is often a, a, a limiting uh, requirement for, for bacterial growth because, oh, I always forget this, iron 3 plus, is that ferric or ferrous iron? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, the chemists, they hate us. They're always doing this. Well, anyway, iron 3 plus is highly insoluble in the presence of oxygen. Ferric, thank you. <laughs> Ferric iron is highly insoluble in the presence of oxygen. So there is a, only a very, very small amount of it present, okay, in uh, oxygenated environments. And it's required, it's an absolute nutritional requirement. So all bacteria have some kind of specific transport system for iron. And these, this often works by producing things which are called siderophores. So siderophores are organic molecules. So E. coli produces enterobactin. And enterobactin has a very, very high affinity to complex with ferric iron. So it forms this complex and then this complex is re-imported into the bacterium by an ABC transporter. So it's able to pick up the very very tiny amounts of ferric iron that are in solution. And other siderophores also exist for the other oligoelements that bacteria require. And in fact this uh, complex is so strong that once the enterobactin iron complex is re-imported, it's got to be chemically degraded to remove the iron and then, re and then rebuilt. So siderophores, all bacteria need them to pick up iron and also other oligoelements. So it's a specialized transport system for, for metals. Okay, so now, since we all love chemistry, right, I'm going to spend a little bit of time going over some basic concepts in uh, 
physical chemistry because we need to understand this stuff to understand how bacteria can extract metabolic energy from very unlikely sources. Okay, so the basic thing we all have to remember here is you, you've done this in biochemistry, right, or not? Yeah, okay, good. So for any kind of equilibrium reaction, you know, where, which way it's going to go will depend on the Gibbs free energy of the process. And there are two terms, delta H, which is the enthalpy, yes, and T delta S being the entropy. Right, okay, good. Uh, well, just to uh, remind everybody that even though uh, an equilibrium might be favorable, it might not happen if uh, some of the uh, um, reaction uh, substrates are very, very stable. So enzymes speed can speed up the reaction rate of, an, of, of, a, of a reaction. But if they are on their own, they can't really change the equilibrium point. Okay. So for exergonic reactions, delta G is negative. You just put an enzyme in here to speed it up. It won't need any particular cofactors. It's just going to go. Endergonic reactions will not proceed towards the, uh, towards the formation of these products, even if you put an enzyme in there. It's just going to speed up the rate at which the equilibrium is reached, and this will be in favor of the... Uh, the substrates here. So if you want uh, an endergonic reaction to go in the wrong direction, you have to couple it to some other process which is exergonic. And in a lot of cases, this is going to be ATP hydrolysis. And if you do this, then the overall delta G of the reaction will be negative and it's going to go in the reaction you want. And uh, so ATP hydrolysis is very, very favorable because you have a lot of negative charge on the triphosphate part and just because of electrostatic repulsion is very, very favorable to separate these charges. So that's how it works. Now a lot of biochemical reactions that cells need to perform are endergonic. So you need ATP to you know, push things in the right direction. So uh, what kind of stuff? Okay, performing particular types of chemical reaction. Transport work, that means like the ATP binding cassettes to import molecules against the concentration gradient. Some of them work directly by hydrolyzing ATP. Uh, mechanical work, this was like, you know, in muscles, if you contract, you need to use ATP. For bacteria, you could think of type 4 uh, pili, which can extend and retract. This costs ATP to, to do that, to generate the physical force. So uh, all, all kind of cells, bacteria and others, need to generate ATP. And that's the whole point of... Uh, you know, uh, energy metabolism. All right, it's part of the point. And, okay, everybody needs to get reducing equivalents in the form of NADH or NADPH as well. So it's ATP that makes everything work in biochemistry. Well, one of the things we kind of forget about is when we say ATP, it's a kind of um, shorthand for other nucleotide triphosphates. So GTP is used in the ribosome for producing peptide bonds. Uh, UTP for producing polysaccharides. If you remember for peptidoglycan synthesis, it was UDP NAM, which allowed the transfer of UD of the NAM pentapeptide to the bactopenol. So all polysaccharides are basically synthesized with UTP. And CTP is used to make, or in all the steps, for making uh, lipids. So I don't know whether this is a coincidence or something, but I, I think it's very interesting. So you've got one nucleotide for proteins, 
one for polysaccharides and one for making lipids and they, all of them for making DNA and RNA, of course. Okay, and then ATP does like everything else, anything miscellaneous. Yes? Um, why, uh, why is there no TTP used uh, for the type of... Ah, why no TTP? Well, T is a deoxyribonucleic acid, right? Um, so my guess, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to this question, but my guess would be that these basic uses of nucleotide triphosphates for running metabolism probably emerged before DNA was evolved. Okay, so these, these are coming from the RNA world and then the RNA protein world and then afterwards it's already fixed. So DNA comes later on and, uh, okay, but the, the metabolism already exists and so TTP isn't used. But a good question, actually. Yeah, I, ne I never thought about that. But anyway, so uh, so that's uh, nucleotide triphosphates. We need to get them to synthesize biomolecules, basically. Um, the other type of metabolic energy which is useful uh, are our redox uh, couples. So everybody knows that oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons and they can be expressed as two half reactions. So in a half reaction, for example, molecular hydrogen is going to be, in theory, broken down into protons and electrons. And the redox potential of this half reaction is expressed in a number of volts, okay? So E is the redox potential of the half reaction. Now, when, I, when you've got these letters here, like zero and the dash, that means it's the measurement performed in standard conditions, 25 degrees centigrade and one atmosphere of pressure. And at particular concentration, I guess, as well of all the components. So it's just like gives free energy. That means that if, if this is negative, then this reaction will tend to occur. Okay, so if you've got a negative value here, that means your molecule over on the left is a good electron donor. It's energetically favorable to like break up this molecule into NAD plus and give up two electrons. Okay. Now, of course, these half reactions never actually exist in isolation. There are, you always have two half reactions in a redox reaction. And then to figure out which way round the redox reaction is going to run or which direction is favorable, then you have to calculate the delta E, so the difference in redox potential. So basically what is going to happen is that reactions are favorable when electrons are transferred from good electron donors, so they have a negative redox potential, to accept us with a positive redox potential. And the difference is redox potential of the acceptor minus the redox potential of the donor. So here this is a very favorable reaction, so you've got electrons being transferred from NADH to oxygen, and it will give you water. And the delta E here, the difference in redox potential is more than one volt. And this delta E can be related to delta G, Gibbs free energy, by this equation, which you don't really have to know, okay? So N is the number of electrons transferred, F is the Faraday constant, and you've got a negative sign here, so that that means that if your delta E is positive, then the delta G is negative. It's favorable, it's going to run. Okay, so why, why, do we, why do bacterial cells and our cells, why do we need to get NADH? Why do we need to generate reducing potential? Well, a lot of the synthesis steps for lipids require the reduction of some kind of carbon compound into a fatty acid. So this requires NADH, and any autotroph which is going to fix carbon dioxide, needs to reduce it. 
So reducing equivalents are also required by all cells. ATP, we need it, we need NADH. And finally, the last form of, uh, for a metabolic energy is uh, uh, our electrical potentials across a membrane. So this is relevant for any kind of ion, but mostly we're just gonna talk about proton motive force here. So this is a gradient of protons. And if you have a higher concentration on the outside than you have on the inside, then the transfer of the protons across the membrane is going to be energetically favorable. So what, what is making this energetically favorable here? Is it your delta H term or the T delta S term? In the delta G, yeah. Hmm? Yes, the entropy, you're right. Because, of course, this is a more ordered state, right? If you've got all the protons on one side and nothing on the other side, this is very highly ordered. And you increase the entropy by mixing them up. So, yes, so this is entropy driven. So, uh, you'll be very happy to learn that it's possible to uh, quantify uh, an ion gradient across a membrane and express it in terms of uh, potential difference by the Nernst equation. Now, uh, once again, you don't need to know this, but the important point about this here is that, okay, you can convert it into some kind of value in volts. And we saw before that we can convert the volts into a delta G. Okay, so basically they, you can interconvert them in the energy value that they have, right? The other thing is, what is important here is that the potential difference you obtain depends on the ratio, okay? So if you've got like 100 millimolar on the outside and one millimolar on the inside, that's gonna be good. So you've got a ratio of 100 to one. If you've got one molar on the outside and 100 millimolar on the inside, it's not gonna be so good. So it's not the absolute quantities that are important, it's just the relative quantities. And that also means that, you know, you can generate quite a big value here if you have a you know, big relative difference. Okay, so uh, protomotive force, what do bacteria use that for? Co-transport, as we saw, okay, for uh, importing malate oxaloacetate. Flagella motion, that works with the proton gradient, allow the, allows the flagellum to turn around. And very importantly, ATP synthesis with the proton ATPase. So this is going to be the basic idea of energy metabolism during respiration, okay? So you start off uh, with a redox reaction, you, uh, you oxidize glucose, and then uh, transport along, uh, an electron transport chain will allow to produce a proton gradient, and then you can produce ATP. Now, that's the way it works in, you know, for in our cells, in mitochondria. But you can imagine a situation where, in fact, all of these processes are reversible. Okay? So if you have a magic way to produce ATP, then you can use that to produce a proton gradient, and you can use that to perform an unfavorable redox reaction. If you have a way you can get a proton gradient, then you can use it to, do, to get these two things. Okay? So the last thing I want to say about this is don't forget the three types of uh, biochemical energy currency. Yeah, yeah. They, they allow you to do work, and they can, well, you, they allow cells to do work in different types of situations, and they can be interchanged both theoretically by trans performing the calculations and figuring out what the delta G is for each one, and also physically inside cells. If you've got one of them, you can get the other two, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna go and do some biochemical pathways here. 
And the really the simplest way to start is to think about uh, fermentation and glycolysis because you're looking at getting NADH and ATP from organic carbon without oxygen. It's the simplest system. So what we're going to do, okay, so uh, glycolysis. So this is glucose to pyruvate. And there are three pathways that are used in U bacteria. The M. de Meyerhoff pathway, this is the one we use. Then Edna Duderoff and the pentose phosphate pathway. So I don't want to turn this into a biochemistry class, but just the basic steps is you start off with glucose and then first step is you know glucose one phosphate then transferred to phospho fructose one phosphate then fructose one six biphosphate or is it g6 phosphate oh, i can't remember anyway yeah maybe g6 phosphate to begin with let me just go back here oh come back come back where was i yes glucose six phosphate is the first step okay Okay, so you, but you have to put in two ATP molecules first to get to this step, fructose 1,6-biphosphate. Then it's going to be split in half to give two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And this is when you start to get some payback here because you can put on another phosphate for free. And then you have two phosphate groups per molecule here and two of these molecules. So if you take them off again, each one generates one ATP. So you get four ATP at this stage here. You've put in two at the beginning. So the net yield is two NADH and two molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. And the waste product is pyruvate. Now the key enzyme is glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase. So this is where you get something for nothing out of glycolysis because you have a favorable redox reaction. So what is happening here? So NAD is getting reduced. So the glyceraldehyde is being oxidized, right? Yeah, that's the way around it must be. So this is, for enigmatic reasons, very favorable. And this is coupled to phosphorylation. And then you can take off the phosphate again, and it allows you to generate ATP a little bit later. So if this step doesn't work, none of the rest can carry on. Okay. Okay, so the, uh, the, the, that's the Emden Meyerhoff pathway. Uh, just to have a little quick look at the other two. So Entner Duderoff here. Um, the, the, the first steps are slightly different, so you don't get the fructose 1,6-biphosphate here. You get this other 6-carbon uh, molecule. And then this is split into pyruvate and one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And all of this part down here at the base, that's conserved. And in the pentose phosphate pathway, further you kick out one carbon dioxide here and get ribulose 5-phosphate which is then split into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and acetyl phosphate. Uh, pentose phosphate pathways often exists in many bacteria and in our cells as well, because this is an important uh, molecule to, for synthesizing ribose and uh, nucleotides, okay? So a lot of cells have these enzymes, but some bacteria just use this pathway only for everything, for energy metabolism and for synthesizing ribulose 5-phosphate. Okay, the other thing is this acetyl phosphate can also be uh, subsequently metabolized to get rid of the phosphate group here and generate one more ATP. So overall, what are the energy yields? So for M. de Meyerhoff, you get 2 NADH and 2 ATP. For the pentose phosphate pathway, you get three NADH and one ATP, and you can get one more from the acetyl phosphate. So this is good.
good, you're getting more NADH. Whereas the Enderduderoff pathway seems to be like the worst. It's the, this is the pits, man. Man, if I was a bacterium, I would never use this. Okay, so, but what, what they all have in common is that they don't generate enough ATP compared to the amount of NADH or NADPH. So the energy economy of the bacterial cell, you need more ATP. So you might say, oh, that's no problem, we'll just metabolize everything. Come on, let's, we've got plenty of glucose, let's just run that glycolysis, baby. But this is where you run into a problem because in order for glycolysis to work and to generate ATP, you need the glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase to work. And NAD plus is an essential cofactor. But if you've run up a huge surplus of NADH, that means there's no more NAD plus inside the cell. So you've run out of the, the, the cofactor. So the way to generate more ATP through glycolysis is you have to get rid of those excess electrons that are stuck on the NADH. Okay, all cells need some NADH, right? So it's not like a, it's, a, it's a waste of time producing this. But glycolysis just produces too much NADH and not enough ATP. So some of these electrons have got to be discarded in order to regenerate NAD plus so that the whole system can run again, carry on running. So you've got to get rid of those electrons. Where are you going to put the electrons? Well, you've got a whole bunch of pyruvate hanging around that you're not going to use for anything. So try and stick them on there. So that, that, and that's what fermentation is basically, okay? So the point of fermentation, all bacterial fermentation pathways, is to regenerate the NAD+, which is used as the cofactor for the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which allows you to generate ATP. And there are simple fermentation pathways, and then other ones that just seem to be annoyingly complex, but they are all performing the fa same function for the bacterium, getting rid of the excess NADH and regenerating NAD+. Okay, so before we have a break, I think what I'm going to do is go through a couple of fermentation pathways. So from um, the textbook, there's this really friendly diagram about of it, which is, you know, they, they make it even worse because they say this is a simplified overview, as if like as if this isn't complicated enough, you know. So. Um, well, I'm going to break this down into several bits, okay? So we'll look at the different parts, one after the other. So the, the message is, there isn't just one fermentation pathway in bacteria. There are several ones and different species use different fermentation pathways. But ultimately, they all use pyruvate. They are, all of the fermentation pathways come back to the pyruvate that was generated by glycolysis. So this is the electron acceptor for fermentation or something derived from the pyruvate okay all right so let's have a look uh, some simple fermentation so the easiest one is lactic acid fermentation so pyruvate is going to be reduced by lactate dehydrogenase and nadh will be oxidized to nad plus so now this is what you have running in your muscles if you ever perform any strenuous exercise. I don't know if I'm struggling on my bicycle, trying to catch up with somebody on an electric bike who's just overtaken me, gets me very annoyed. And I'll put in a big effort and produce some lactic acid. Um, yeah, but so very, very frequent in many bacteria. So lactobacillus, streptococcus, lactococcus, all of these bacteria that are used in producing cheese, yogurt and stuff, okay? Now lactic acid fermentations can be homo or heterolactic. So what does that mean? 
Homolactic fermentation, lactic acid is the only fermentation product. Heterolactic, it's lactic acid plus something else. Okay, and that can often depend on the glycolytic pathway which is used because if you have, well, if, if bacteria are using the emden meyerhoff pathway, they'll be producing two molecules of pyruvate per molecule of glucose, and they might both be transformed into lactate. There'll be a homolactic fermentation. If they are using the pentose phosphate pathway, they will produce one molecule of pyruvate, one molecule of acetate per glucose molecule, and then they can both be reduced, and that will give you yeah, one molecule of lactic acid and one molecule of acetic acid. So that would be a heterolactic fermentation. Okay, so that's that. So just one jump from pyruvate to lactate. The other one that we all know and love, right, is uh, ethanolic fermentation. So the first step here is pyruvate decarboxylase is just going to uh, cut off this uh, kind of a CO2 group here. And that will leave us this part of the molecule, which is acetaldehyde, which will be uh, reduced by alcohol dehydrogenase. So mostly this is used by yeast, but some bacteria can do this as well. Okay, so zymomonas can perform ethanolic fermentation. And for all of these things, I don't know if you really need to, you don't need to remember the structures or anything, but you need to be able to say which bacterium performs which fermentation pathway. Okay, so lactic acid fermentation and ethanolic fermentation, they get the job done, okay? They push the electrons onto the lactate, onto pyruvate or something derived from pyruvate and they uh, produce some kind of fermentation product which is uh, just released from the bacterium. Problem is, both of these things end up being toxic because this is lactic acid. If there's a large amount of it, the pH will go down and this will stop the bacteria from growing. Ethanol, well, you don't want to be a bacterial cell floating around in 10 or 15 percent ethanol it's going to be i mean even a human being you'd definitely be killed if that happened to you so uh, once these fermentation products reach a concentration that's too high they'll prevent bacterial growth even if you know you've still got enough glucose hanging around so that's one of the drawbacks of fermentation they can produce toxic uh, waste products yes Where do the protons go? Hang on, NADH, so it's gone here? Yeah, I mean, but it's, uh, no, for, yeah, I mean, we, uh, we have these products, dioxide carbon. Where are these protons? We have them for PDC. For pyruvate, oh, okay, here. Oh, yeah, so this is coming off. It's... Uh, Okay, so it would actually be a bicarbonate ion in solution, but that's in uh, equilibrium with CO2, right? I, I, I think. <laughs> okay. So please save that kind of question for biochemists. Okay, so... Um, so... The other more compli complex pathways of fermentation kind of make sense if you realize that perhaps the objective is to produce a waste product that is slightly less toxic. Okay, so butane diol fermentation, very common in enterobacteria, so enterobacter seracea and bacillus as well, gram positives can do this. So without going into the details of the chemistry here, so Two molecules of pyruvate, pyruvate here will combine. One CO2 will be kicked out. So you get this five carbon molecule called acetolactate. 
goes down to aceto acetoin, which is four carbons. And then this will be reduced to 2,3-butanediol. So it's a you know, short chain alcohol, uh, which industrially apparently is very useful. It was used during the Second World War as a way to produce uh, starter chemical for artificial rubber. But since then, a lot of these uses have been replaced by petrochemistry. But there's now renewed interest in trying to use microbial fermentations to produce this chemical as a kind of new way to get uh, green uh, plastics chemistry. If we can produce the starter chemicals just from biological material, we won't be so reliant on petrochemicals anymore. Okay, so there's interest in, in trying to uh, exploit this uh, industrially. So some of these strains, if you really push them, they can produce yields that, that I think, oh, I don't know if I have it right here, but you can have like 15% of the liquid volume is butane diol at the end of the fermentation process. And it's something like, yeah, something like 0 0.4 grams of butane diol per gram of glucose that you put in. So they can really produce a lot of this stuff. So inter potentially interesting for industrial processes here. Okay, so so far that's all right. And now we're going to end up with a propionic fermenta fermentation and mixed acid fermentation pathways, which are a little bit less easy to understand. But what you have to, well, I, I don't know, kind of what, what, what makes it easier for me to understand anyway, is that to try and realize what the other metabolic uses of pyruvate are inside the bacterium. So if pyruvate is going to be used in respiration, then it's going to be transformed into acetyl coenzyme A and then combined with oxaloacetate in the and to, 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 to perform the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Now, pyruvate is the precursor of oxaloacetate. So this can be produced from pyruvate. And it's very useful for bacteria because it's the starting compound for the synthesis of several amino acids. So a lot of bac well, bacteria are going to be using some of the pyruvate to produce oxaloacetate anyway for other parts of the cell metabolism. So one of the fermentation pathways makes use of this transformation of pyruvate to oxaloacetate, which bacteria are performing anyway, and then progressively reducing the oxaloacetate to malate, fumarate, succinate, and then finally propionic acid, which is excreted. So propionic acid fermentation, propionibacterium. That's an easy one to remember. So why do they do this? Why is it so complicated? Well, what you have to realize is that these are all Krebs cycle enzymes running the wrong way around. So in order to get this system to work, the bacterium doesn't have to invent a whole biochemical pathway with one, two, three, four, five enzymes produced just to do one little thing, just got to produce this one. So it looks complicated for us, but in terms of what the bacterium has to do to get it to work, it's not that difficult, okay? Because it's already got all of this stuff running anyway. And then I'm just going to go through this and then we'll take a break, which I think some of you need, right? Okay, so this is the, the most complicated one. So mixed acid fermentations. Many enterobacteria perform these, Escherichia coli, Salmonella, a whole bunch of stuff. So basically what is going to happen here is that you're going to produce acetyl coenzyme A. 
and then this is going to be the kind of starting point for the different uh, pathways to produce the uh, fermentation end products. Now, as I showed you before, if pyruvate is going to be used for respiration, then the enzyme here is pyruvate dehydrogenase, which will strip off one CO2 molecule and transfer the rest onto coenzyme A to give you acetyl coenzyme A. Now that's not going to be very good for fermentation because this step also produces NADH. And that's exactly what you want to get rid of. That's the whole point of fermentation, right? So in a mixed acid fermentation pathway, pyruvate dehydrogenase is not used. It's another enzyme with whom the name of which I am afraid I have to look up because Okay. Oh, I can't see it. Oh, no, that's for that's for later. Okay, I think it's called. Well, we'll check it out after the break, right? Okay, I think it's called. I don't know pyruvate formate lyase or something like that. Okay. So this enzyme is going to provide one molecule of acetyl coenzyme A, but instead of kicking out. CO2, it will give you a molecule of formic acid. So you'll get formic acid as one fermentation product. And then the acetyl coenzyme A is going to be reduced to give you a bunch of other products. Okay, mixture of other products, ethanol, acetic acid, acetic acid butyrate, this kind of thing. Now, the problem here is the buildup of formic acid. This is the main acidic fermentation product in a mixed acid fermentation. So once the pH starts to come down, then E. coli will start to produce another enzyme which is going to break down this formic acid into dihydrogen gas and CO2. So depending on the pH growth, pH of the medium during the fermentation process, you'll either get a lot of formic acid produced at neutral or alkaline pH. And when the pH becomes slightly acidic, then you get less formic acid and much more dihydrogen gas. Now the only interest, well, it's okay. So it, it, this, this is really complicated, okay? The other ones, are, you can try and understand them. It's kind of simple. Why, why, why are E. coli doing all this complicated stuff? Well, the only reason I could see is that some of these um, pathways in a mixed acid fermentation process allow you to generate an extra molecule of ATP. So this is the kind of advantage of a mixed acid fermentation pathway compared to all the others. You can maybe squeeze a couple of extra ATP molecules out of the process. Now, the other thing that is also useful to know is that this is going on all the time inside your intestines. It's very common in enterobacteria. And because there is some ethanol production, some of this is getting absorbed into your bloodstream. So everybody is walking around with a very, very small amount of ethanol in their, in their blood, even though you don't actually drink any alcoholic drinks. So you can never have a kind of like a blood alcohol limit that is absolutely zero because everybody is, you know, produce, it's being produced naturally inside your body. And this can actually be a problem for some people who have a microbiome that is dominated by bacteria that are fermenting and producing ethanol. And this was found out by some lady, I think, in America. She was pulled over by the police because she was driving like this all over the place. And uh, they gave her a, 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 you know, an, an alcohol test uh, and she, you know, she was over the limit for driving. And she said, no, I can't be, I haven't had anything to drink. I, 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 and she, instead of just accepting uh, points off your license, this kind of stuff, she took it to court because she, she was convinced she hadn't had any alcohol to drink. And it was true, it was actually her gut bacteria had produced all this ethanol. 
So there are people that have this problem, and especially if they eat a lot of sugar in one sitting, then they can have a peak of fermentation, and they can, they can get drunk because of uh, gut bacteria.